Welcome to Thinking Green. I'm Rana, and uh, once again, we're returning to a, a topic that is very timely. You know, a couple weeks ago, there was a big heroin bust in New London, and just a couple days ago, uh, it was in the news that a dozen Wesleyan students had landed in the hospital after ingesting what they thought was MDMA. So uh, my guest tonight, um, and I'm so pleased he's here, we've had to reschedule a few times because of this crazy winter we've had, is Patrick Hines. And he is a LEAP speaker, that's Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. And he's a retired corrections officer and substance abuse counselor. And um, he has a, a pretty long presentation uh, about the war on drugs, where we are, how we got there, and how we can get out of it. So welcome, Pat. Thank you. Um, I guess uh, maybe briefly you can talk about what your background is and how you ended up involved with LEAP. Well, I, I spent 20 years uh, in corrections, working with uh, incarcerated populations. Uh, and the last 10 of those years, I had gone on to complete my education, get my uh, counseling license, and was a corrections officer slash counselor, uh, substance abuse counselor in a correction setting. I retired about six years ago, and I ran into the uh, LEAP website, which is uh, www.leap.cc, and I started reading uh, some of their information, and it was very interesting, and uh, as I read further into it, I just ran into information that I found hard to believe uh, about America and uh, what's going on and what are the unintended consequences of this war on drugs that uh, we've been waging. And uh, so I decided to contact them and get involved. And it's, uh, LEAP is an organization that was founded about a little over 10 years ago by uh, several uh, high-ranking retired law enforcement uh, personnel, uh, chiefs, lieutenants, and many uh, of them worked as narcotics agents, correct? Many of them worked as narcotics agents. Uh, it, but we also have judges uh, that are members and uh, prosecutors, uh, former prosecutors, and uh, every stripe of uh, law enforcement uh, experience. Uh, we have people in the organization who have come to realize uh, that the war on drugs has not worked. It's an abysmal failure. It's not good for public safety. It's not good for officer safety. Uh, and it's just a complete disaster. Well, you have a huge amount of information uh, backing up this claim, because some people who watch are watching might be skeptical. So I think let's go start and go into your presentation. And um, we'll talk about points as we get to them. Sure. Uh, there, there is so much. Uh, Information, this is the, the LEAP uh, logo, our organization. Uh, America declared war on drugs in 1971. Uh, we've been at war for 44 years. That's a pretty long war. Uh, and have we won yet? <laughs> well, uh, I would say that the war on drugs has been won decisively, but it's been won by cartels and by terrorists and by uh, street gangs and drug dealers. But uh, certainly, uh, it hasn't been won in the way people who started it intended it. Uh, we spent one trillion dollars on the war on drugs. Uh, and we've affected 41 million arrests, which is kind of staggering. Uh, and as a result of this, how did we go from this? And growing up in the 50s, this was my uh, sense of law enforcement to serve and protect and it was officer friendly and uh, they often lived in the neighborhood and knew everyone well there was a lot more community policing at the time and then everybody's familiar with the Norman Rockwell painting about uh, you know uh, the police officer is uh, he's on your side he's looking out for you and he's talking to the kid who's running away from home and so forth and so how did we get from that to this uh, a militarized police force that looks like they're at war 
Uh, with who? Well, with the general public. Uh, and, and this was, in, in New London, it was kind of a big topic not that long ago when our police department requested riot gear, and many of us citizens thought, whoa, why, we don't have riots here. Well, Why do we need riot gear? Uh, you know, the militarization of uh, policing in America, that's a whole another uh, issue. It's one of the unintended consequences of this policy, this failed uh, policy, this unwinnable war. Um, but the answer is pretty simple how we got there. We got from Office for Friendly to that military unit because we created this unimaginably rich criminals. And the way we've created unimaginably rich criminals is because since we have refused to take responsibility for regulation of uh, drugs, uh, criminals are more than willing to take that job on. Well, that's pretty profitable. We have guaranteed them an unimaginable funding stream by allowing them to be in charge of regulation, taxation, and di distribution of drugs. And just to, uh, by way of a little historical perspective, uh, before 1914, there was no such thing as an illegal drug in America. Uh, you could buy heroin in the local drugstore, and it was like $4.48 an ounce, and people would put it in uh, juice and so forth for cough remedies and so forth. And uh, so America had lived like this for... Uh, you know, 150 years without anything being illegal, and it wasn't a nation of drug addicts or anything. Uh, but then, uh, in 1914, uh, the government determined that 1.3% of the population was addicted to drugs. And so they decided to pass the Harrison Act, and that's the first time in American history that any drug in America was ever made illegal. Uh, a few years later, five years later, in, in 1919, they uh, passed the 18th Amendment to uh, the Constitution, and they st started the great experiment in uh, prohibition, uh, and prohibition was begun. And did prohibition work? Uh, I think if you ask anybody about prohibition, often in LEAP, when uh, I, I tell people I'm uh, with the organization Law Against the uh, enforcement against prohibition. They said, Pro prohibition ended <laughs> years ago. And I said, well, prohibition of alcohol ended years ago, but uh, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about all prohibition. Prohibition just doesn't work. And in the case of alcohol, many of the temperance union people who originally had wanted alcohol prohibition saw that the effects were worse than the disease. I exactly right. So it's, it's like... Uh, good intentions. And we all know uh, 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 that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. They, the good intention was that you see the, the horrible cost of uh, alcohol addiction and so forth, and you want to remedy it. So you figure, well, if there's no alcohol, well, people just will eliminate the problem. But of course, that's not how it works. So uh, once they realized that um, a prohibition didn't work, uh, they repealed uh, Prohibition right. and uh, decided to uh, influence people through regulation and so forth. Uh, and then you eliminate a lot of the unintended consequences, like enriching organized crime and so forth. And in fact, it's uh, uh, <clears throat> speculated that uh, Prohibition, alcohol Prohibition, created organized crime because <coughs> you... The only thing worse than a, a, a violent antisocial sociopath is an, a violent antisocial sociopath with unlimited funds. And so by uh, taking responsibility for the regulation, uh, taxation, and distribution of alcohol, you put the Al Capones out of business. And, and one point, <coughs> um, there's water. And one point that I wanted to, to make also was that um, that alcohol does remain a problem for some people. So prohibition or, or taking away prohibition doesn't mean that we can't treat people who have addiction problems or substance abuse problems. Uh, prohibition just takes the criminal element out. Absolutely. And, and um, 
In fact, you, you bring up a very important uh, point, and we don't want people to confuse LEAP with an organization that is pro-drug. I'm a licensed substance abuse counselor. I want to get people sober. I want them uh, to uh, be uh, emotionally well and uh, living fulfilled lives. Uh, we don't, uh, we're not pro-drug. We're anti-violence, we're public safety, and we think prohibition works against those goals. But we also believe that the best way to facilitate harm reduction, uh, incident of onset of use, and all of the negative consequences of drug use is through a public health model rather than a corrections model uh, of intervention and harm reduction. Okay, so I think um, we can go back to the, the slideshow and, and look at some of the effects that our current drug prohibition has had. This, uh, these unintended consequences, of course, uh, getting back to prohibition, before prohibition there were 15,000 saloons in America, and at the end of prohibition there were 32,000 speakeasies in America. Be, and Einstein during the time uh, observed uh, that uh, the, percentage, the pr prestige of government ha has undoubtedly been lowered considerably by the prohibition law. For nothing is more destructive to respect for the government and the law of the land than passing laws which cannot be enforced. It's an open secret that uh, prohibition, the, the shocking rise in um, crime in this country, uh, is closely connected to prohibition. So this business about uh, respect for the government and respect for the law of the land and that nothing is more destructive to it than passing laws that are unenforceable and then setting police to the task of enforcing an unenforceable law, sending them on a fool's errand for 44 years is destructive to uh, policing, public safety, police, uh, uh, you know, uh, policing uh, uh, morale, uh, and people lose respect for the law. And inevitably, uh, it's going to be enforced somewhat arbitrarily, so it won't even make sense. Well, there's a lot of uh, troubles, uh, uh, problems in the way in which the war on drugs has been enforced. Uh, uh, in large part, the war on drugs is prosecuted in the inner cities uh, where uh, there are uh, much larger uh, communities of color. So uh, when the hammer comes down, it doesn't come down evenly, even though uh, every sociological study available indicates that substance abuse remains uh, pretty much uh, constant across racial lines. Uh, for instance, uh, approximately 73% of uh, Americans are white, 73% of uh, illegal drugs are consumed by whites, 13% of Americans are black, uh, approximately 13% of illegal drugs are consumed by blacks. Uh, but uh, who gets arrested and incarcerated for that is much different than, or, so who's getting consequence for this illegal use of drugs? And you can use drugs in two different ways. You can use them uh, to get high with, or you can use them to make money with. And so when I say use of drugs, I mean whether you're using them, selling them to make money, or whether you're using them. Yeah. Uh, and some people think, oh, it's just these uh, minorities that are selling the drugs, because they're always getting arrested. And they're the people that yeah. we see on TV. Um, well, they, they live in the cities, and that's where the SWAT teams are and uh, the big uh, police budgets and uh, so forth. But, uh, and, and there, I have some uh, uh, data points that are pretty yeah, shocking. Yeah, I, th I think we should look at them regard. because they are really shocking. Uh, uh, all right, uh, prohibition ended. In 1971, uh, uh, President Nixon was facing a tough reelection fight. He decided to get tough on crime, so he started the Schaefer Commission. And he appointed some congressmen to look into uh, drugs in America and the effects of marijuana. The Schaefer Commission, uh, after much re uh, research, the commission concluded that uh, neither the marijuana user nor the drug itself could be said to constitute a danger to public safety. Now, this was in 1970, a very conservative wow. time. And this is what the, the Schaefer wow. Commission uh, determined. And, and uh, I'm guessing the 
commission members were appointed by the conservative government. It, it was a very conservative government. We were in uh, Vietnam at the time, and uh, uh, this is, they said it's not a big deal. It's, but uh, nonetheless, uh, President Nixon uh, went, uh, decided to ignore that. Uh, and uh, once again, he used the government data that said 1.3% of the population was addicted to drugs. Uh, now, this is not a partisan issue. It's not a Republican issue or a Democratic issue. Every uh, administration since 1970 has followed the same drug war policy. So Republicans, Democrats, they've been equally short-sighted uh, in pursuing this And uh, for me, policy. the ir irony is our, our last three presidents who come from both those parties have admitted that they use drugs. Well, it's something like... Uh, uh, 46% of uh, Americans over the age of 18 have reported that they have tried an illegal drug. So it's, it's kind of curious to me what kind of a civilization determines that 46% of its population is criminal. Uh, now, according to the DEA's own reporting, uh, after 40 years uh, of the modern phase on the war on drugs and a trillion dollars spent and so forth, that drugs are uh, more available, they're more powerful, and uh, inflation adjusted, they're cheaper than at any time in history. And this is just showing you that capital, uh, capitalism works. You know, when there's a competition <laughs> in the marketplace, people are trying to come up with a better product, uh, give you, uh, you know, a baker's dozen, whatever. Uh, so uh, the war on drugs hasn't worked. And, uh, now, I, this is another concern that I have about the war on drugs. By the way, that's me in 1968, a year after I graduated from high school. I'm 18 years old. I'm on my motorcycle. My buddy and I are heading out to California because we, were, we wanted to be hippies. Uh, and we're 18 years old, and we're driving down Route 66 uh, through the desert, through the panhandle of Texas, going 90 miles an hour, and we had marijuana on us. And uh, what I didn't know at the time was that at that time in Texas, Texas had a two-year mandatory minimum jail sentence for possession of marijuana, even one seat. So we could have been pulled over easily, and uh, if we were searched, they would have found the marijuana, and I would have spent two years in a Texas jail as a long-haired hippie from Massachusetts. <laughs> that would have... Uh, unalterably changed the trajectory of my life. Now, I, I'm a, a proud veteran. I was able to serve my country. I've uh, been in public service. Uh, uh, I'm uh, retired. I feel I've made a positive contribution to society. Had I gone to jail at that time, none of that would have been possible. Fortunately, we didn't get stopped in Texas, and that's us arriving <laughs> in California. And, uh, but what's horrifying to me now about that is that I was 18 years old and uh, having gone on to uh, complete my education and get my degree in uh, psychology and uh, uh, counseling, uh, I learned that uh, in human development, the brain doesn't finish growing until you're about 25 years old. And the last part of the brain to complete growing is uh, the prefrontal cortex which is the part of the brain that's responsible for your if this then that thinking. This is the part of the brain that allows you to accurately anticipate consequences for behaviors. But mine wouldn't finish growing for another seven years, so I didn't have it all available to me, and we're cruising through the desert 90 miles an hour on these tiny little motorcycles, and of course our perception is, what could possibly go <coughs> wrong? Uh, well, lots of things could have gone wrong, so to consequence young people for this biological reality that they are going to uh, uh, choose uh, high-risk behaviors, uh, they are uh, going to ill-consider the possible consequences for these choices, and to destroy their lives because of these youthful indiscretions uh, that they got involved with because their prefrontal cortex hadn't finished developing seems to me not like a wise policy. 
So, uh, and, and the war on drugs is waged in great proportion against young people. And one felony conviction can destroy a person's life. And LEAP, we say, you may get over the addiction, but you'll never get over the conviction. Oh, yeah, it, it affects your ability to go to college, uh, get financial aid. I think it's harder for someone with a drug crime to get a federal financial aid than someone who's, you know, knocked down a, a liquor store. Yeah. Now, if we can go back uh, to the slideshow mm -hmm. just for a minute, this is what, when I was perusing the LEAP website, this is what caught my attention. It almost made me fall out of my chair, and I couldn't believe that it was true. And the f this is the fact that in America, we are a little less than 5% of the world's population, but we are responsible for 25% of the world's incarcerated population. Oh. That means that one out of every four human beings incarcerated on this planet is in an American jail. In the, the land, land of, of the, the free. free right? Yeah. Uh, this to me was horrifying. I couldn't believe it. This, you know, I took an oath uh, to defend my country, uh, uh, the land of the free, and this just didn't seem like the country that I was uh, thinking of. By comparison, uh, uh, the average European nation, uh, their incarceration rates are about 150 per 100,000. Um, and uh, in America, our incarceration rates are like eight times as high. Now, does that mean that Americans are eight times more degenerate or deviant, or we're just putting more people in jail for uh, what other nations see as lesser crimes? There's an unintended consequence to that. Um, to do this, in 1970, our uh, the budget for fighting the war on drugs was $100 million. It's kind of like, uh, reminds me of uh, Austin Powers and Doctor, <laughs> the, the crazy doctor, $1 million. And, well, it's not so much because today we spend $70 billion a year fighting the war on drugs. But has it changed anything? Are drugs less available? Um, School children still report that it's easier to buy uh, drugs than it is to buy cigarettes because cigarettes, although terribly dangerous, um, uh, the fourth most deadly drug in America, I think. Um, oh no, the number one most deadly drug in America, sorry. Uh, it's hard for kids to get them because they're regulated. Uh, they're uh, regulated. Uh, we have uh, taken a public health approach to harm reduction. Uh, when the Surgeon General's report came out about uh, substance abuse, I mean about uh, 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 cigarette use and uh, cancer, uh, about 75% of adults in America smoked cigarettes. We took a pub public health approach to harm reduction and intervention, and today about 17% of adults smoke Tobacco. We did it through regulation. We put warnings on it. We gave people accurate information. We allowed them to make informed choices. And, um, and we didn't throw them in jail. We didn't arrest one single person. We didn't destroy one single life. And we got the results we wanted. Now, everybody who talks about, well, we have to have this war on drugs, their intentions are good. They want uh, communities to be safer. They think that uh, drug use causes violence. Um, in LEAP, we believe that there is no drug violence. There's only prohibition violence. And of course, the vast sums of money that people are willing to fight over and, um, uh, you know, all these crazy behaviors of shooting across crowded parks and so forth. It's about money. Uh, and because it's illegal, it isn't as though each side can hire a lawyer and fight it out in court. Yeah, yeah. You cannot uh, regulate anything that you make illegal. You know, you've just given over that power to the black market. Um, now, uh, the... Uh, before the war on drugs, 2% of the population had used uh, an illegal drug. Now about a third of adults uh, in America are, 
or even more, uh, well, about a third of adults in America say they've tried an illegal drug. And once again, what kind of a country uh, call 46% of its population a criminal? Uh, now, and people say, well, you know, it works. We get drugs off the street. So here's some of the DEA's own data. Um, in 1970, an average uh, 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 seizures of uh, local or state police in 1970 was uh, one ounce of cocaine and one uh, quarter ounce of heroin. Today, uh, in, by 2002, drug seizures in the United States, they had seized wow. 10 tons of heroin. That's dump trucks full of it. Uh, they wow. uh, uh, seized 20 tons of cocaine. And if you look at those numbers, you'd think that it's been a success. So I ran some numbers. Uh, and here's what I came up with. 10 tons of heroin equals 52,000 pounds equals 844,000 ounces equals uh, 26... 1,654,000 grams of heroin. Now, it takes a heroin ad uh, addict, on average, about a gram of heroin a day not to get sick, and he'll shoot up three times a day. Um, and if you're selling that, and that's a bundle, that's 10 little bags of heroin, and if you're selling that at $100 a gram, all the, uh, the seizures of that, those 10 tons of uh, heroin, $2 billion. It's a pretty big number. One would think that's a pretty big number. Unfortunately, uh, it's jump change in the prohibition drug industry because uh, the annual United Nations World Drug Report uh, has estimated the worldwide annual illegal drug profits are in excess of $322 billion. So we've taken away $2 billion from them, and about, America consumes about one-third of these drugs. Um, so that leaves them $320 billion. So, so really, we've taken away less than 1%. Less than 1%. And of course, if you were Budweiser, you'd say, well, that's spillage. And you know, if you're in business, you're going to have a little spillage. If you're a farmer and you're producing eggs, you're going to break a few eggs. But it's spillage. You just figure it into the equation. It's really a drop in the bucket. Um, the unwinnable war on drugs is also a national security issue. It's destabilizing our neighbors. So first of all, we're enriching our enemies. Now, remember, the, this $322 billion is going to uh, terrorists, cartels, street gangs. Uh, and year after year after year, they have this uninterrupted, unimaginable funding stream uh, and it just seems suicidal to me that we should continue uh, to fund crime almost as well as we fund the Pentagon to try and keep our... And better than we fund things like yeah. education. And how horrible is it? Uh, I, I, uh, the war on drugs, uh, here we go. Um, Mexico, our second largest trading partner. Uh, in a three-month period, uh, and uh, since they began the war in 2006, uh, this is a map of the deaths and disappearances in just a three-month period. And since 2006, they've had 60,000 Mexicans have been murdered, and 24,000 have disappeared. Um, it took us 10 years of Vietnam to lose 50,000 American lives, and it was a pretty traumatic, uh, it was very traumatic national to experience for us. Uh, they've done it in half the time. But if you think that they're uh, just one third of our population, it's like three Vietnams for their national consciousness in half the time. And I can only imagine how disruptive it is to live in an environment like that. So this is also a border security issue. Our drug policy is destabilizing our southern neighbors. If we make American aid contingent upon them signing on to our get tough on these people, war is the solution uh, to this problem. Uh, it just causes this kind of bloody chaos. Uh, the cartels continue to get 
better funding than the government. Whole regions of countries are becoming uh, unmanageable, uh, I mean ungovernable. Uh, we're producing um, uh, little Afghanistans uh, in our, on our own continent in South America. Uh, so it's a national security issue. It's a, uh, a trade issue. Uh, our second largest trading partner is becoming destabilized through this cartel violence and so forth uh, by pursuing this unwinnable war. And, well, um, and immigration has been a huge issue in our news. Uh, there are a lot of people who uh, feel very threatened by the rush of immigrants, and we're seeing really people arriving here in, in dire straits, children without their parents. Uh, so what effect is, uh, how much has the drug war contributed to that problem? I think it's, it's the major contributing factor to that issue. When you think about parents sending their children unescorted uh, across the country uh, to enter America illegal and what a desperate act that must be for parents to send their children like that. How desperate must it be where they're sending their children from? Uh, a, a, a powerful definition of uh, desperation I heard once is that desperation is the death of hope. And I think these people are just that desperate that they send their children hoping that they won't get killed. Uh, they are forced to join the cartels, participate in the drug trade, or get killed for refusing. Um, even the Mexican police, there's a, 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 a phrase down there, they uh, call it uh, gold or blood. And the police are told by the cartels, you will participate with us, cooperate with us, and we'll pay you gold. If you refuse to cooperate with us, we'll kill you. So it, your choice is gold or blood. Um, and that's just a suicidal policy to maintain. It just destabilizes the whole country. It's no wonder that uh, people from South America are crashing our borders. I think if we ended our policy and uh, if we took responsibility for regulating this commodity, which are, we now call illegal drugs, that's another thing that's uh, amusing in um, and a very unamusing uh, way is we call illegal drugs controlled substances. With this policy, they are the least controlled substances uh, in America. You know, I mean, we control cigarettes, we control gasoline, we control right. uh, uh, all kinds of things that are, have potential to harm. But uh, illegal drugs, we have absolutely no control right, over. Right, so we don't know what went into the manufacturing it, of it. We don't know the dosage. We don't know who's going to be allowed to buy it. We don't know who's getting killed along the way. Uh, the thing about regulating drugs, uh, because LEAP's goal is to make America safer. Regulated uh, drugs are always going to be safer than unregulated drugs. Uh, and the example, of course, uh, is proven through alcohol prohibition. During alcohol prohibition with the uh, bathtub gin and so forth, uh, the uh, uh, alcohol content of the alcohol was, uh, wasn't always known, and often it was too high, and it resulted in alcohol blindness. We're having the same uh, problem today. If we want to keep our children safe, yes, kids are going to get their hands on alcohol. Uh, but it's going to be difficult for them. They're going to have to show an ID, uh, and it's, but they will get their hands on it. But at least if they get their hands on it, if they get a bottle of Jack Daniels, I know that it's, if it's 80 proof, it's going to be 40% alcohol. It's not going to make them go blind, and hopefully they'll survive it, and they'll survive it with their sight. The example we see today is... Uh, there was just an issue, and they're, they're all, it happens all the time with this Molly. And you mentioned it early, earlier about the uh, Molly. Uh, kids go to these events, and it's usually college-age kids. And like uh, we said, kids are going to do uh, uh, high-risk behaviors. There's three things you can do with drugs. You can experiment with them. Uh, you can use them recreationally, and you can become addicted to You can abuse them and become addicted to them. So kids are going to experiment do high-risk behaviors, and they're going to uh, take a pill. But because it's unregulated, 
Uh, Molly, I understand, is a pretty uh, complex compound and uh, takes some expertise to make. So if you get the real stuff, it, it might be $30, $35 a pill. But if I'm some sociopath, I can say, well, I'll just get some gel caps and I'll make up some junk and I'll go sell it to these dumb college kids and I'll sell it to them for 15 bucks and they'll think they're getting a deal and by the time whatever is gonna happen happens, I'm gone in these events. I can just go from event to event. Uh, there was this organization um, that went around to these events and they bought Molly and they, then they brought it back to the lab and tested it and it was like uh, upwards of 85% of this stuff was not Molly. It was, uh, the vast majority of it was a combination of, uh, the, vast, uh, the largest percentage of it was bath salts and it had some, uh, a little dash of uh, crystal meth in it and a little dash of heroin in it. And uh, so instead of having to, uh, you know, get a, a pill that's uh, difficult to make and, and uh, actually the chemical uh, they call Molly, uh, this drug dealer can just make this concoction. Uh, he can sell it for $15 and it costs him 15 cents. And he's make. not checking IDs either. And he's not checking IDs. And... Uh, so re you can't regulate something you make illegal. So we say regulation is a public safety issue, all right? It's not a, it's not a, a party issue. It's not a pro-drug issue. It's, it's a public safety issue. Um, here's another unintended consequence. Uh, does uh, uh, drug policing make our community safety? And due to the uh, prioritization of enforcement of prohibition, police have to divert, uh, or they, as a result, they've diverted resources from uh, protecting us from others to protecting us from ourselves. Now, police are very good at protecting us from others. They're terrible at protecting me from me. They can protect you from me. They're nice. good at that. They're trained for that. But they can't protect me from me. Uh, that's not their jobs. They're not social workers. They're not counselors. It's not their job. It's unfair to put them in the position where they have to try and do that. But since there's this $70 billion a year coming down the, the tube for this war on drugs and people take the money and then they buy the equipment and then they, they, want, they get used to the money and that becomes their priority. And as a result of that, the unintended consequences are police are less able <coughs> to protect us from violent predators. And the data supports this. In 1963, police were credited with 91% of murders being solved. Today, it's only 62% of murders are solved. So really, the diversion of manpower is, has had a huge effect It's a on waste of uh, policing resources, and it really accomplishes nothing. And you talk to police, and they'll tell you, well, we arrested this guy, we took him off the street, we were watching him for six months, but... Tomorrow, someone will take his place. And there might be a couple of shootouts along the way as a couple people exactly, compete for, exactly. for his so, place. Uh, uh, down in Mexico, they took down some big cartel, head of some gigantic cartel, one of the most powerful cartels. And people say, boy, this is a real victory for the war on drugs. Well, if somebody arrested the, the president of McDonald's, do you think they're going to stop selling hamburgers tomorrow? Is it going to affect anything? No, some lieutenant just takes over, but for probably three or four or several lieutenants or, or uh, lesser uh, subsidiaries of the cartel are fighting it out, causing havoc, more blue and red dots on that Mexican map to see who's going to take over. Um, so it doesn't change anything. Uh, it's just, I call it, uh, I call the current policy uh, um, I don't call it the war on drugs, I call it the whack-a-mole uh, drug policy. Because if you've ever been to a fair, county fair, the, the uh, arcades where you play whack-a-mole and you whack one mole and another mole pops his head up, this is exactly what's been going on for 40 years. Uh, so why would we keep doing this? And the, I have to ask the question, who does, whose agenda does following this obviously failed policy serve. And that's a subject for a yeah. whole other uh, is. issue. But we can talk a little bit about some of the other uh, unintended consequences. Well, 40% of murders go unsolved, 50% of aggravated assaults go unsolved, 60% of forcible rapes go unsolved. 
80% uh, of all property crimes go unsolved. So it's a great time to be a criminal, even if you're not a drug dealer, because they're spending six months and 6,000 hours of police hours, uh, you know, uh, observing somebody and uh, undercover operations and so forth to make this arrest. Uh, the other stuff doesn't get done. Here's another thing that just horrified me. Because law enforcement's priority on drug enforcement, uh, 188,000 rape kits sit untested in the United States. Now, what's horrifying about this to me is um, probably half of these people are already in police custody. And if they've gone to jail on a felony charge, they probably have had a DNA swab. And if we test these kits, we can uh, check them against the database. And we already have them. So by not testing these kits, not only have we denied justice to the original victim, we've uh, denied justice to the f future and sure victims of these predators when they get released again. So because we, this war on drugs has become such an addiction in law enforcement, um, we don't have the resources to protect our uh, wives, our sisters, our mothers, uh, and test these kits, it just seems insane to me. It's gotten way out of hand. It's, it's, it's the antithesis of public safety. So that's a, that's a powerful, uh, um, that's a powerful uh, indictment of the war on drugs right there. Okay, and I'm afraid we're getting close to uh, like the five minute mark. So let's oh. go through the um, other unintended consequences and then we'll spend the last little bit of time letting people know how to the get The other thing that involved. I like to bring to people's attention about the war on drugs is the racist aspect of it. And, and uh, this is another thing that just horrified me. Um, and um, you know, uh, drug use is, is pretty even across uh, racial lines by population. 72% uh, of drugs are consumed by uh, uh, white folks uh, and they're 72% of the population. 13% of drugs are uh, used by uh, black folks. They're 30% of the population. Uh, people don't have to believe this information. They can Google it and check it out. However, 53% of all persons who enter prison because of drug convictions are black. They're only 13% of the problem, but they're 53% of the um, prison population. A black man is 10 times more likely to be incarcerated for a drug charge uh, than a white male. Same charge. Um, now, incarceration rates in the United States, remember they were uh, like eight, eight times higher than uh, European nations, right. uh, or whatever it is. Uh, but uh, incarcerations for black males. By comparison, in 1993, under apartheid, the most racist regime in modern history, uh, the South African uh, regime would arrest 851 South African blacks per 100,000 population in America. And people, you can't believe this. I can't believe this. But if you go to the uh, 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 Bureau of Prisons' own data, this is what these are the numbers that they produce. Wow! In, in America, we arrest four thousand nine hundred and nineteen African Americans per one hundred thousand. Uh, that's uh, uh, five, some six times more than South Africa did. So who's the most racist regime in modern history? How does that happen? I want an explanation for that, an honest discussion of how that can right. possibly happen in America. Uh, the other thing is felony disenfranchisement. It means if you get a felony in several states, Virginia, Florida, and Kentucky, you lose your right to vote forever, which wow. uh, in Florida, uh, a million and a half people have lost the right to vote forever, and a third of them are African Americans. In Virginia, half a million people have uh, lost their right to vote, and half of those are African Americans. So we've got almost a million, uh, which is and almost that's forever. So they've yeah. done the time, but they're still right. But they're still paying. So, if and if you follow this data through, one in five or twenty percent of African American adults are just in Florida, Kentucky, and Virginia. Now these are these are key states, and every time there's a presidential election, and they're working the map, and they say, well. 
He yeah. can't. He can't win without Florida. He can't win without uh, 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 Kentucky. Without Virginia. And there's uh, twenty percent of the African American community is disallowed from voting. Taxation without representation. Uh, and to me, that's horrifying. I want an explanation for that. So, what's the war changed? Uh, before narcotics were illegal, 1.3% of uh, people were addicted to drugs after they were uh, made illegal. 1.3% of uh, people were addicted to narcotics. And after 41 years of drugs, the government's own data says 1.3% of the population so suffers from addiction. So whatever our policy is, it's not going to change the addiction rate. Addiction, according to the uh, uh, American Psychiatric uh, Society, uh, the people who produce the uh, uh, Diagnostic Manual of Mental Illness, uh, say that 15% of the population will suffer from addictive disorder. Uh, so if you have 100 people in a room, 15 of them will have an addictive disorder. 10 of those 15 will be addicted to alcohol. Of course. Another uh, percentage will be addicted to exercise, uh, gambling, whatever. And 1.3% of the population will be addicted to uh, narcotics, you know, cocaine, heroin, something like that. Another problem with the war on drugs is it's predicated on so many lies. Marijuana is classified as a class one drug, just like heroin. So when you tell kids, well, uh, marijuana is a class one drug, just like heroin, anybody in America for 10 minutes knows that heroin right. is not the same thing as marijuana. So kids say, well, the government's gonna lie to us about drugs, so we can't believe them about that. Why would we believe them about anything? So we want to give them some valuable information that's accurate about drugs that can do harm. Uh, they're not going to believe us. Uh, and the other thing is that now there's this the big popular uh, um, uh, politics of fear or whatever it is, uh, is that there's this uh, enormous heroin crisis in America. Uh, the DEA's own number and the UN World Health Organization's own number estimates that in America, which consumes about a third of the world's uh, heroin, um, there are approximately 800,000 to 1 million heroin addicts. That is not a crisis. That is a percentage, that's a fraction of 1% of the American population. It is a significant population in need of services, which we can certainly provide, but it's not a runaway train crisis. The crisis is the prohibition violence associated with that. Because if you figure an addict, it takes an addict $100 a day to maintain his habit, and we've got a million heroin addicts, that's $100 million a day. That's a pretty good market. Now, we have just a couple minutes left. So what I was going to ask you in the last couple minutes is to give a, a short summary of what a sane policy might look like. Well, there, uh, fortunately, there's some real good examples um, around the world. Uh, Switzerland. Yeah, we can't. Uh, yeah, I know. Yeah, they, yeah. Switzerland, um, about uh, five years ago, decided to stop waging war on heroin, and they decided to adopt a public health model uh, of harm reduction as regard to heroin. And, um, you know, before that, in the 60s, they tried a hands-off approach and said, we're just not going to bother with it anymore. And they, they had this uh, park in one of the big cities in uh, Amsterdam or something, and uh, uh, it, uh, it was called Needle Park. But the heroin addicts still had to buy their drugs from uh, uh, criminals, and it was still uh, ridiculously inflated, the price and so forth. So they decided to make it a, a public health issue and uh, a mental health a disorder. And they, started, they opened up uh, uh, medically supervised injection sites for heroin addicts. Uh, each injection site has a substance abuse counselor, a doctor, uh, social worker, uh, information, pamphlets, resources, and they can go in there and under medical supervision inject their heroin three times a day. Uh, they don't have to prostitute to get the money for it. It's cheap, there's sliding scale, whatever if you can afford to pay, you pay and so forth. Uh, as a result of that, uh, in five years, their felony crime rate went down by 65%. Uh, 
um, because the heroin addicts don't have to be criminals to maintain their uh, heroin addiction, which is a mental health disorder. Also, they have all the resources they've saved. Uh, uh, they can apply towards intervention, harm reduction, uh, uh, you know, reduction of onset of, of new users and so forth. It was estimated there was a Harvard uh, economics uh, professor who uh, did a study and he estimated uh, through incarceration savings and so forth that if we regulated uh, all drugs uh, the way we regulate tobacco and alcohol, uh, we would have a $81 billion uh, revenue stream. And with that, we're out of time. Okay. So uh, leap.cc for more information. Thank you, Pat, for coming down. You'll have to come down again because uh, it's just endless. There's so much talk more. Talk about a lot. Yeah, the unintended consequences go on forever. Okay.